Welcome back to How to Tickle Yourself. I'm your host, Duff McDonald, along with my co-host, Matt McButter. Today's guest comes to us from the other side of this country, Los Angeles. Steve Lopez is a longtime columnist for the Los Angeles Times, a four-time Pulitzer Prize finalist. He has checked off a lot of boxes in his nearly 50-year career. He's been a columnist for Time Magazine, Philadelphia Inquirer, San Jose Mercury News, and the Oakland Tribune. He's written three novels and the best-selling nonfiction title, The Soloist, which DreamWorks made into a movie. No less than Mel Brooks refers to him as the Frank Capra of the LA Times, always telling warm, heartfelt stories. Steve is 67 years old and still going strong but has, in recent years, been pondering the question of retirement. His daughter's headed to college this fall, so he and his life will soon be empty nesters, and he's wondering if he should spend less time writing and more time playing tennis before his knees give out on him. All of which brings us to his latest book, Independence Day, What I Learned About Retirement from Some Who've Done It and Some Who Never Will, which will be released in just a few weeks. In search of an answer, Steve talked to dozens of people about their own retirement-related decisions and found that there are about as many answers to the question as there are people. In the end, I think he came to realize that all the good advice aside, the question of retirement, like most of the big questions in life, is one that no one else can answer for you. You gotta figure it out yourself. So we're gonna talk to him about his search which is wonderfully chronicled in this funny and poignant book. Before I let him talk though, I'm gonna read you my favorite passage from the book in which he describes his career. He's talking about a column that he's just written. And he says, the column gets posted Saturday morning and seeing it on the website gives me a lift. The same lift I've felt for 45 years. Every time I experience the miracle of seeing my hastily assembled, unformed thoughts get published. It's the greatest scam going. So from one scam artist to another, welcome to the show, Steve. Great to have Um, you. It it does feel still like kind of a scam, (laughs) and uh, I'm still playing that game. Yeah, well, thank you for that nice introduction. At the present moment, my love, my dear, Oh, everything's connected. This life, this world, it's all right now, right here. Right now, right here. Right now, right here. So uh, Matt and I were talking just before you got on here. My latest book uh, myself, uh, I wrote is called Tickled. And unlike the nonfiction I've written before, it's more memoirish. And I uh, sort of looking back at it, it was me sort of sorting myself out in print. And when we, when I was reading Independence Day, that's a messy proposition. <laughs> it was like you know you took a question. And and d- d- did this great sleight of hand with it. You turned your own personal search into it, also a book. So it's like you, you're 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 um, double dipping on the on the question itself. Well, um, let me tell you how it all began. I was um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. What would that be now? My goodness, the the way time has warped during the pandemic. I guess three th- three, three years yeah, ago. Yeah. So my uh, my book agent was uh, was in L.A. and we've been friends for many years and we're having lunch. And I told him that I I was beginning to think of retirement, but I was really conflicted. And he said, "Well, what do you mean?" And I said, "I love what I do, and I, I consider myself one of the lucky. I've been on a." a a lucky run for, you know, almost 50 years, almost half a century, getting good jobs where I, for the most part, get to pick a story I like and go and tell it or, you know, rattle some cages. Um, It's not always like uh, Mel Brooks said, me writing warm, heartfelt stories. Sometimes I tear people apart, whatever, you know, whatever mood strikes me when I wake up and whatever is happening in the news. Anyhow, 
I love that. I love it. But I'm actually now about to turn 69. So 70 is coming up fast. And um, when my parents were my age, they began with their cognitive loss. They began with their uh, their heart conditions were accelerating. And these I'm headed down the same road. I mean, I've had a pacemaker in my chest since I went into cardiac arrest during a, uh, a knee replacement um, years ago. And, and I, I fear, my, my big fear is that I'm going to wait. Although I love what I do and feel privileged to be able to do it, there are all these other things that I had on my list to learn how to finally play the damned guitar to get fluent in Spanish and maybe uh, buy one of those $1 houses in Italy where one side of my family is from. And um, come on, $1 for a house in Italy, you can actually do that. And I thought, go in with a friend and it's 50 cents and you're living in Sicily. Um, and when am I gonna do those things? And what if I wait too long to do them? And when I finally cut the cord at the LA Times, stop writing columns a couple times a week, what if I don't remember my wife's name? And what if um, I'm too hobbled to be able to enjoy going for a walk, um, you know, on a vacation or in my new 50 cent home? And so it's really tough to figure out when to let it all go. And the other thing that I wrestled with was, who am I going to be after being this person for 50 years with a kind of quasi public job where I was in on a, you know, a, a conversation that was like a running conversation with the public, with the readers? And what do I have when that's gone? So that's what I wrestled with. And it's uh, and, 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 and my agent said, that's a book a lot of people might want to read. And I said, why is that? He said, because of the boom, because of the, the, the wave is cresting and 10,000 people turn 65 every day in the United States. I didn't believe that until I looked it up. But a lot of people are, are having similar thoughts. And I thought maybe I should write a book about it. You know, it's like... Uh... Uh, a journey through all sorts of different communities of of people where you 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 give us um a wonderful array of perspectives one of my favorites was there's um a guy named Maury in there who's who's over 100 and you mentioned that he um he titled his memoir the answer to the question of how to live a long life. And so it's called keep breathing. <laughs> <laughs> so here, my, here's one of my takeaways. You're sort of wrestling with a future decision and, and kind of overlooking the fact that you've made the present choice, right? When should I retire? The answer is obviously not now, right? So, so you're trying to, you're trying to wrestle down, a theoretical future thing when the main thing that you can do is what your rabbi uh, friend told you. She said, you'll know, right? And clearly it's not time for you to retire. She did say that. I thought that was uh, sage advice. I thought the, the problem was I got great advice on both sides of this, you know, <laughs> right? Do, do it now, get the hell out while you still can. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what you do. In fact, that same rabbi said to me, um, uh, "This, you are in the city and the city is in you. And I can't imagine you not wanting, not seeing something and wanting to write about it. And um, that's true. I mean, that's, that is so true. Today, my column in the LA Times, um, we spent almost $600 million building a new bridge to replace a decrepit one that was uh, falling apart. And the opening of it is a huge, sensation. It's a spectacle in LA. It connects um, Boyle Heights, kind of a working class, mostly Latino community with the dazzling downtown, um, you know, high rises. And it's like a link to opportunity from, you know, one world to another. And the opening of it has sparked a celebration. And also a bunch of knuckleheads are out there spinning donuts and the new bridge is full of skid marks and people climbing the arches. And I thought, I got to write about that. I got to go. And I remembered I had a student when I taught at Cal State LA who, who told me about walking across that bridge, holding his grandmother's hand when he was a boy, and he couldn't wait for the new bridge to be built so he could walk his daughter across the bridge. So I call up Gus, and Gus says, I'm appalled by what's happening. And I'm thinking, what a great story that is. I got to write it. So I spent a night on the bridge, and I talked to Gus. 
And I'll tell you, if I walk away and a bridge opens and there are people both celebrating and desecrating the bridge and I don't have a forum, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I may have to get the hell out of L.A. and move either to upstate New York or to Canada. In fact, I've been thinking a lot lately about moving to Canada. <laughs> and and start up- You're talking to two Canadians. You're talking You're to two here. Canadians. We endorse that <laughs> idea. I just wonder. I wonder if... Um, I wonder if when I do stop, I need to get out of town because my 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 thoughts day and night are about what's going on in California. What stories am I missing? It's not it's not just which ones do I need to get to. It's which ones am I missing? I've got to be missing the best ones. And um, I may need to get out of town in order to have peace of mind. So you say uh, here's another line from from the book. Maybe I've got it all wrong. This idea that I need to figure things out, map my future, know who I am. Again, may, maybe you will have to leave town, but you'll, that bridge, <laughs> mind the pun, you'll cross that bridge when you come to it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I am, um, I'm fighting with this book that uh, while I don't want to give away the ending because the book is set up as kind of a TikTok one year mystery as I set out on this um, course to try to figure out by talking to other people, happily retired, miserably retired, what do I want to do? Um, but I did make a decision because the idea of the book is at the end of the year, decide to do something. Of course, it's not set in stone what I decided to do. I mean, look, you're talking to me about a column that I just wrote. So obviously, I'm still writing <laughs> some. I'm not writing as much, though. And speaking of Mel Brooks, that was his advice. Why not do a little of this and a little of that and enjoy the best of both worlds? And that's where I am right now, but um, I don't know how long that's going to be good. Um, I, I, I do find myself having trouble doing what I think I need most to do, which is to live in the moment. And mm-hmm. I need to just, as you know, not like I want to name drop um, in this conversation, but one person I really enjoyed talking to about all of this was Norman Lear. And he's got a he's got a column in the New York Times today about turning a hundred oh, really? today. Oh, I didn't I didn't see that. Yeah. But anyhow, what what he said, I, I I wanted to talk to Norman Lear and Mel Brooks because they're in their 90s and still producing. And I thought, mm-hmm. is it something about the curse of having some in sense of in civic engagement? looking for stories and some creative energy in you? Is it just a curse that you're going to have to learn to live with? And how do I figure it out and map the rest of my, my journey? And what Norman Lear said was, why are, you, why are you wasting time worrying about that? He said he wakes up in the morning. He's got, you know, probably six projects he's juggling. He gets an inspiration. He goes over to the computer and he gets to work. And he said, why do you have to figure out anything other than the moment, and he's the guy who said that he thinks of these two words frequently, over and next. And whatever you did yesterday and beyond is done. Stop thinking about it. Stop worrying about it. And live in the moment with what's next or right in front of you. And if you find enjoyment in that, keep doing it. And when you don't find enjoyment in it, find something else to do. It was, it's so obvious and so simple. And yet I find myself reflecting on that quite a bit in the year or so since he said that to me. Hmm. It's like, and, and to go back to Mel Brooks, sorry, Matt, I'll let you get in here in a sec. Mel Brooks, you were telling him something about some stuff you'd like to do. And his, his reply was, then do it. Yeah. So basically it's the same advice. It's like, do the things you're supposed to do in the moment that they, you're supposed to do them. Right. Instead of, of the forecasting thing, it's when it, when it presents itself and says, do this, then do this. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Duff, another thing is that um, the, the rabbi said it, it might be a mistake to wait until retirement to sample these things that you've always thought you wanted to do when you had more time. Um, why not begin to sample them? And so. Um, I said, all right, she's right. So I started uh, studying Spanish every day 
Um, my last name's Lopez because my grandparents are from Spain. On the other side, my grandparents are from Italy. My father grew up speaking Spanish um, as the son of immigrants from Spain. Um, but when I was growing up, he spoke only English. It was that time when immigrants wanted to be seen as Americans. So I've been, you know, all my life um, thinking I finally got to get fluent in Spanish. So anyhow, the, the rabbi said, sample these things. Don't don't cut the cord and walk out there and try these things that you you really don't know how they're going to feel. Start to get a feel for them. And so I, I began every day working on a little bit of Spanish and working on a little bit of guitar. And um, I am now coming up on one year of playing the guitar virtually every day. And it's um, maybe an hour, maybe it's 20 minutes, maybe it's two hours. And I'll hear something, you know, I'll hear a song um, like, uh, like, I'll just be, you know, YouTubing, uh, surfing YouTube. And there's um, Sting playing the guitar on Englishman in New York. And I'll think, oh, my God, that mm -hmm. is such a beautiful chord progression. That is so beautiful. Can I play that? And the thing about learning an instrument today, as opposed to when I was a teenager, any song you can think of, go online, and there are 10 knuckleheads telling you exactly how right. to play it. So I'm playing Englishman in New York. And then it's like, wow, I heard the Beatles playing um, here, there, and everywhere. Could there be a, a simpler yet more beautiful song? So I've been playing the guitar, and it's been... Yes, I want to do more of that. And um, I, it was a good idea to sample these things because I am really, really getting a lot of enjoyment out of, uh, in particular, the guitar. I'm not doing as well in Spanish. <laughs> That's great. I, you know, I, a couple of things I found interest, really interesting at, right up, up front was your pros cons list, which is something I, I've always done is pros cons list for the big decisions. And I ended up almost exactly where you ended up, you know, sometimes more confused at the end of doing my pros cons list than, than before, because, you know, you sort of, you sometimes it, it, that more data doesn't really help you make that decision. Yeah. I could make a good argument either way. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and I ended up, I ended up kind of frustrated. Uh, yeah. I think that was early on in the book where I thought mm -hmm. I am not a list person. I'm more of a gut. Just go by your gut, but with a decision, this momentous, I want to get it right. And so mm -hmm. then I wrote down, I gave it my best on those reasons to keep working. Well, yeah, that's pretty convincing. And then gave it my best on reasons to pull the plug. Um, as I was finishing this book, I, I suffered a, a personal um, loss um, that, that, um, that has me trying to become more Zen and more um, in the moment. Um, and more reflective on all of this. And um, the, the, the book, I don't know if in the advanced reading copy, the dedication is there, but it's dedicated to my son who I lost. And, um, oh. and I, I, I've given so much, so much thought in the last, it, we're coming up on a year. And it's one reason I reach for the guitar every day because it was either a guitar or a therapist. And um, I thought as long as I reach for the guitar for an hour or two every day, I can put off talking to the therapist, although that's probably what I really need to do. Um, but but facing a loss has me rethinking everything, even everything that I wrote in the book, and examining the question of what we do with how little time we have here, um, and how to have. I mean, it sounds so cliche-ish, but I, I I feel like I'm still struggling to figure out what I really want to do and who I want to be, and get on with doing that. And suffering a loss, um, I think, um, I feel kind of forced to come to some discovery about myself now, to know uh, who I need to be to go on, to get through what is every day um, um, the tragedy relived. And, um, and I don't know. I, I don't know that work is going to do it for me. And I, I do fear, I mean, this fits into the themes of the book, I fear that given the void I feel in my life um, and given that my daughter is away at school and I've lost my son, that if I wasn't working and having to knock out columns and having to see what's happening in the city and who's running for mayor and which one holds the most promise, I'm not sure what I would do with that empty space. I'm not sure that I'm cut out for retirement right now unless retirement is a total reinvention. 
It's like uh, supporting a cause, being a volunteer or something. But what what the, re- the amount of reflection that I went through during the writing of the book was pretty heavy duty. And what I've gone through since this loss is also heavy duty. So I'm, I'm, it's like, I don't know, maybe in the next year or two, I'll figure out who I am and what I need to do. But um, I'm working on it. So I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Condolences for the loss of your son. Yeah, I wasn't you. aware of that. I just had a, a, a question as well. I, I, you mentioned it earlier, but in, I think, 2012 with your, with your knee operation, you had a, you know, a, a near death experience or actually, you know, cardiac arrest. I think it was for your heart stopped for a minute. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it was touch and go there for a little bit, but, you know, they put a pacemaker in and revived you and, and here you are today. <laughs> um, did that uh, experience also, you know, make you pause and reflect at the time in, in a way, you know, that, uh, you're maybe revisiting now 10 years later. Matt, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, I'm not sure why, but my wife and daughter are tired of hearing me talk about the fact that I was dead once, (laughs) (laughs) um, but they do not like, I don't know, like, you know, it's a, it's a fun story uh, to tell at parties or something and they're tired of hearing it. Just like, (laughs) yeah, they're not, you know, my wife, when I said, Hey, the pandemic is kind of a trial for my, um, my retirement. I'm, you know, it's like a preview. Here I am at home and we're both home together. And she said, if this is a preview, I don't want to see the movie. <laughs> but, um, I, I do think that um, although they have no consideration of, of what I went through, to me, it, it shook me up. It shook me up because it's a, it's not just a reminder of um, our own mortality, but how quickly it could happen. I mean, I went in with a slight arrhythmia um, and was totally cleared by the cardiologist to have a knee replacement. And in post-op, my heart stopped. And um, yeah, so I left with a new knee and a pacemaker. I argued that I shouldn't have to pay for the pacemaker. I didn't go in there for it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it does give me, it, it, it is, it definitely has colored my thinking on all of this. And the other thing, halfway through the book, halfway through my year, my one-year journey to figure out whether to retire or keep working, I was leaning toward um, continuing to work pretty strongly. And I got an email one night um, from a county, a former county official telling me that a former city official had just died. And that guy was a longtime councilman who had been termed out of office. And I told my wife about this because my wife is very good friends with his wife. And I thought, oh, my God, Tom is the same exact age as I am. and here he's died and the original um, you know, word was the, uh, that it was cardiac arrest, which had happened to me. And I thought, I have got to stop working. Whether I have enough money or not, and that's another matter that I didn't really take up in the book because I didn't want it to be about the, the financial side of it. There are a million books on that. I wanted it to be about the spiritual. Um, I thought, I've got to quit. I mean, because I, I know from my own experience that you could go in, in, at any second and now Tom, who's exactly my age, is gone. I couldn't believe it. We drove over to, to the house. My wife tried to comfort Tom's wife. And I, I, I drove away. We, we drove home. And I was thinking, that's it. I mean, what do I do for the rest of the book? Because I've decided I'm going to keep working. And then I started to think about it. And this was a guy who was Mr. L.A. and identified through his work for many, many, many years. And when he retired, he lost that. And I thought, is this an example of not being able to create a new identity for yourself in retirement? And it's all a little more complicated than that in Tom's case, but it really hammered home that point that if I were to retire, I've got to do so with a plan. I mean, the idea of just winging it and wake up each day and what do I want to do? That kind of living in the moment is not going to work for me. Um, Apologies to Norman Lear. I felt like I need kind of a plan if I'm going to retire. And I just decided in the end, I wasn't ready. I was ready to cut back and uh, have a little more recess in my life, but to not give up the privilege of being able to, to tell stories. So you're not an easy glider. I'm, you, you saw that. Yeah, you know what? Yeah. The, the, the person who came up with that term, Nancy <laughs> Schlossberg, has written several books on retirement. She's in her 90s, and she was like a retirement guru. And she told me, and this is good advice for anybody who's considering this. And I imagine a lot, a lot of listeners out there are considering this. Um, she, she said that everything will change. 
Do not think for a minute that things aren't going to change. Everything will change. Your relationship with your wife is going to change. Your relationship with time is going to change. Your relationship with your identity, um, with the future is going to change. And all of these transitions will be difficult. And you should not cut the cord without giving them some consideration. And that doesn't mean that you can you can figure it all out. And, you know, would life be that much fun if you could figure it all out? Probably not. But you need to think about that. And, and she, she, Matt, you're exactly right, has these six categories of the kinds of retirees. And she called me a continuer. And a continuer was mm -hmm. that if I do retire, well, then maybe I'm going to mentor student writers. Or maybe I'm going to be a freelancer, which is what um, I think maybe Mel Brooks said. It, you know, I said, I want, maybe, what if I want to live on a kibbutz because I've never done it? Or what if I want to live in Barcelona and um, become a flamenco dancer? And he said, how long are you going to do any of these things before you think to yourself, hey, this would make a great travel piece. Let me call an editor I know. <laughs> or hey, maybe it's a book. And then you're back to work. So he said, learn to live with the curse. You're never getting completely out of this jam. Yeah. And like the yogis would tell you that you are searching for what's already there, right? As if there is a future you who is different than you. And you're, I think what both of these guys are telling you is stay in the, like, you can only, there's only one thing you can do, right? Which is make the decision that you're making right now. Yeah. It's the only thing that's sort of within your, the realm of your capacity. So it's like, instead of uh, distracting yourself with what will I be focus on the, what you are. And that's your right. And because ultimately that's the only thing you'll end up doing anyway, because you can't act in the future. Are, are you, you, are you a therapist? You sound like, the therapist that I quoted my book, because I, I, was, I was talking to him about my big dilemma here, about my big problem that sits in front of me. What do I do? And I've got to make this decision. And my problem is that I really like what I do, but I want to do other things. And, um, and you know, he said to me after listening quietly, Steve, I wonder if maybe the, the problem that you're talking about is not really a problem. You're, you're right. living your life. You're, you're you're doing a lot of the things you want to do and you can craft it in a way to do, you know, to, to change the mix a little bit, but to still do all of these things. He said, you, you look like you're trying to crack, solve this puzzle, you know, crack this big problem. But you don't sound to me like a guy who has a problem. You like to write and you're a columnist for the L.A. Times. That's not necessarily an easy job to get. You got it. You enjoy doing it. You enjoy going on vacation, spending time with family. Just, you know, what, what's the deal? What's, what's, what's your problem? There's not a problem. Just, uh, just, you know, call me next week and we'll talk some more. <laughs> so that you just reminded me, someone told me this joke once, uh, my, it might take a second to sink in, but it's the following. There's two economists walking down the street and one of them points to like a fancy sports car. And he goes, I've always wanted to buy that car. And the other guy says, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You are a therapist. <laughs> so, no, well, look, the subtitle to my latest book, Tickled, is called A Common Sense Guide to the Present Moment. And it's deal. it was grappling with the, the sort of uh, move in trying to get to where these guys are all telling you where to go, right? Which is pay attention to what's happening. Right. Um, you'll retire. You know what? You know when you're going to retire? When you retire. Right. There's your answer. And like it, that doesn't make for a book, but like and your book is a wonderful like uh, meandering through all the thoughts of it. But what all those guys, including the rabbi and everyone keeps coming back to, um, I talk about a lot in Tickled, which is um, there is there are speculations and there's what's happening and they're fundamentally different. And the only one in which you have the capacity to do anything uh, is the decision you're making right now. And we don't want to we we don't we don't want to blow the end of it uh, for people because both of us highly recommend this book. I have another quote I want to read. 
because <laughs> this reminded me of myself. Uh, I find myself still wavering and influenced most by the last person I've spoken to. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's like my my late my latest greatest idea is always the last one I've stumbled on. Yeah, and I, that is that is so much me, and I always I always feel that it, it's a really negative. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't feel proud of the fact that I don't have enough of a spine <laughs> to be able to decide independently what I believe. It's the last. No, the last, no, no. Yeah, the last person has turned me completely around. <laughs> in in a similar way, I, I find I sometimes am seeing the world through the lens of whatever book I'm reading at that particular time. Yeah. Right. Like it, it influences my thought a lot. And I always think, oh, this is so influential. This is really, you know, cha you know, this is really providing so many insights and context about the world until I pick up the next book and forgot most of what was in the previous book. Yeah, or and start seeing the world through the context of the next one. Yeah, or the the next book you read says that last book was like I didn't know. What it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's how I feel about the column too. Though it's like the writing a column is like uh, being a, a, you know, you you write one and you move on quickly to the next one um like a hit and run driver before anybody realizes you had no idea <laughs> what the hell you were talking about the last time you gotta keep moving keep moving <laughs> you, you you also had you were uh talking about a column you wrote at one point and you said i haven't made a decision to do this it's more like an involuntary response which is the greatest it's like that that's that, sort of what I was referring to before. It's like you can't help doing it. Yeah, that's what you need to be doing. The things you can't help but be doing. Yeah, you know, like I was talking to you about the bridge opening, and I I, I couldn't wait to get a hold of my former student because when he was in my class at Cal State LA, he wrote that beautiful essay, one of the more beautiful pieces of writing that I saw in my five years as a. Uh, you know, I, I taught a night class there about how do you find stories in L.A. and how do you tell them? And this this guy um, wrote about that bridge in such a compelling way. I couldn't wait when the new bridge opened here in the last few weeks to get hold of that guy. And I thought this is going to be a good story. I got to I got to find Gus and see if he's walked the bridge with his kids the way he did with his grandmother. And and I love that. I loved talking to him. I loved walking that bridge. And it's uh, I, I, I just don't feel ready to walk away from that. It's a wonderful book, uh, Steve. It's been so good to have you here to the li to listeners. Again, it's called Independence Day. What I've learned about retirement from some who've done it and some who never will. It, and it's not just for people, you know, on the verge, you know, um, it, it pushing into retirement age. It's got a bunch of really interesting insights. Uh, just about life itself. And also, even for people who have already retired, I think uh, it would be worth it to give you some additional perspective. So I recommend this book to anybody. Highly. Not just uh, a bunch of 67-year-olds. Uh, so, um, and check out Steve in the LA Times uh, while you still can. <laughs> this <lady's gone. laughs> it's been great to have you, Steve. Uh, we really appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Okay. Uh, Steve Lopez. He's he's pretty great. That guy's got the gift of gab. No wonder he's uh, a revered columnist at the LA Times. He's yeah. um he's really fun to talk to. Yeah. Uh, and insightful. And like you said, I mean his his writing just goes down so easy, right? It's just, it's, it's just so, so easy to read. There's a thing that the, that the great columnists do where they, um, Rich Cohen does it too in his books where they'll start you somewhere, they'll zoom out, they'll zoom back in, they'll zoom, and they know how to do that, uh, move, you know, better than anyone. It's like, it start with a individual story, zoom out to a public issue, and then go back to the thing, and, and then close the loop. The book. Yeah, yeah. Great, great stand-up comedians do that as well, right? It's how they kind of yeah. keep you engaged. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we never even really got into. I mean, you mentioned it in in uh, in his bio, but many re or many listeners would probably be familiar with uh, the soloist, 
um, which was the novel he wrote that was made into a movie starring Jamie Foxx and right. Um, who was it? Robert Downey Jr. Um, and it played was ba- Steve Lopez paid, played Steve Lopez. And yeah. And it essentially about the friendship that he developed with, uh, with a kind of street, was it a celloist street, like yeah, a Juilliard, yeah. Juilliard trained musician who ended up on the street, um, was schizophrenic. And, uh, Steve developed like a relationship with him, wrote a book about it, was made into uh, the, the movie that you mentioned. So just wanted to throw that out there to connect the dots for a couple of listeners. So he plays tennis, uh, yeah. and he mentioned, you know, that if his, if his knees start to give out, give out on him, maybe he'll take up pickleball. Oh yeah. I love pickleball. And I just wanted to note that I have recently taken up pickleball. What? Joey and I have been, pl- yeah, Joey and I have been playing at Total Tennis and Socrates with our friends, Jamie and Marissa. It's so fun. It's amazing. We have to play. I, I play the odd game of pickleball. Yeah. I still play, I still play some tennis. I play some pickleball. I play some padel. I play some platform tennis. I'm, I'm a big fan of all of the tennises. I love, I love the, <laughs> like, I was never a tennis player, but yeah. I do like ping pong. Yeah. I'm not bad at ping pong. And the sort of combo tennis ping pong thing of pickleball is outstanding. Yes. It's well, so you, good. you should, you should look into there's platform tennis as well as kind of a, another similar one. And cool thing about that is you can play off the back. Like it's sort of enclosed in taut chicken wire and you can play some, you know, it's like got oh, a, little right. bit of, okay. a little bit sort of, of like squash. squash or racquetball. It's got a little bit of squash or racquetball mixed in there as does Padel. So that, yeah, there are so many, you know, I think people, would probably be surprised at how many tennis derivatives, like we're only scratching the surface with those ones that we've named there. Like every country has its tennis derivative from, you know, I got, I got, I got uh, some runway here with pickleball. I love it. We just started. So uh, what a line from his book, uh, he talks to this guy, father Boyle. Yeah. And this is one of his quotes. He goes, the baseline is to go where life is. And as long as this gives you meaning, why would you stop? Right. There's your answer. Or at least there's my answer to me. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing until I don't want to do it anymore. And then I'll do something else. Right. Right? <laughs> Duff, I, I've really got one for you here. All right. What do you got? This one comes from across the pond in the UK from the great Richard Odomodu, also known as Odie. The, the Richard Odomodu? The Richard Odomodu. Odie. And he just finished reading Tickled. And he said, which he said is fantastic. He's trying, trying, trying to better himself. Trying to better himself. Right? Trying to tickle <laughs> yeah. himself. And he said, yeah. just finished uh, the copy of Tickled that you sent through. And it was fantastic by the by. And that got him, that got him, you know, I guess, wondering uh, origin of the term by the by. He wanted to have one for us. So Odie's got one for us. By the by comes from the old sailing term, sailing by the by means sailing close hauled or close to the wind direction for the non-sailors out there. So if you weren't sailing on the by, you'd be sailing with your large sails out, you know, away from the wind's direction to refer to the form of sailing that one would say kind of by and large. So by the by. Hmm. Half points. Wow. Odie, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, other listeners, uh, please use this as an inspiration. We've got room for yours too. And that one was uh full points. We'll give it full points. All right. I guess I guess I've got one for you. Keep them coming, folks. So I've got two things to close out here. You know, I felt a little bit there like I was telling uh Steve Lopez when he should retire. When when I started by saying is it's a question you can only answer yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So after the day I finished his book, I was reading um uh, so the poetry of Fernando Pessoa, who's a Portuguese, uh, writer and poet from the early 20th century who has, he's just amazing, but he also had something like a uh, half dozen heteronyms, they call them, which are like, he had like five different writing careers as five different people, including uh, situations where two of the people would be in discourse with each other, different characters. He wrote as Ricardo Reese. He wrote as 
um, Fernanda Pessoa. He wrote as a woman. I forget her name. Hmm. But anyway, just genius. But what's so the difference? Sitting- just quit. What's the difference between a heteronym and a pseudonym? Just when you have a lot of them? It's not, it's the number. Well, that's, that's a good question. Th- and thank God we have the internet right here. Oh, you have the internet there. Nice. Look it up. Um, oh, maybe it's not a heteronym. Christ. Anyway, he had a bunch of different characters. And so I've been reading his poetry recently. I'm not a real poetry reader, but his stuff really speaks to me. And it's so on point with Steve Lopez and the question of retirement. And here it goes. Beyond the bend in the road... There may be a well, and there may be a castle, and there may be just more road. I don't know and don't ask. As long as I'm on the road that's before the bend, I look only at the road before the bend. Because the road before the bend is all I can see. It would do me no good to look anywhere else or at what I can't see. Let's pay attention only to where we are. There's enough beauty in being here and not somewhere else. If there are people beyond the bend in the road, let them worry about what's beyond the bend in the road. That, for them, is the road. If we're to arrive there, when we arrive there, we'll know. For now, we know only that we're not there. Here, there's just the road before the bend, and before the bend, there's the road without any bend. A more duff, I could not, I could not like pull a more duff poem out of the right? a- annals of poetry. I told you he speaks to me. That's from 1914. All right, to close this out, we don't have uh, an Oriabindo today. We have a special uh, line from Nisar Gadada Maharaj. Uh, and um, it's a little on point as well, but it's also just brilliant. He says, desire not, fear not. Observe the actual as and when it happens. For you are not what happens, you are to whom it happens. Ultimately, even the observer you are not. You are the ultimate potentiality of which the all-embracing consciousness is the manifestation and expression. And his point there is, Uh, We're not the things that happen to us. We are the possibility that those things could even happen at all. Right. So don't get stuck on the event. Don't get stuck on what's happening as if it defines you. That's simply the expression of your potentiality. Stay back at the realm of possibility and know that everything is going to be all right. But Duff, I'm hungry. (laughs) I desire food. Right. As as and when it happens. So go get some food. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. At the present moment, traveling town to town, the mystery of the motion right here, right now, right here, right now. You've been listening to How to Tickle Yourself with your hosts, Duff McDonald and Matt McButter. You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with others. You can talk to us and see what else is happening on Instagram and Facebook at How to Tickle Yourself. This program was recorded in Studio B of the historic Rock Ledge Recording Studio and the Tunnel Under Arundel. Right here, right now, our original 16-part theme music was written and recorded by the legendary Paul Reddick and Kyle Ferguson of the Sidemen with the brilliant Steve Mariner on bass and drums and in the mixing room. The podcast is produced and distributed by Storic Media. Our editor is Andrew Steiner. Our coordinator is Samantha Abramovitz. Our producers are Kristen Verbitsky and Chuck LaBella. For more information, visit storicmedia.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-C media.com. My love, my dear.